enzymes that are called peptides, the digestive proteins, and the small peptides. And then that is the sample that we analyze to see it actually put into the matrix of quality. And then add the matrix to it, and form in the previous slide. And then you require the laser and you would obtain this mass spectrum. You would obtain the mass spectrum, and this mass spectrum then is of the protein that you originally selected. Okay, it's of the protein that you originally selected, plus all of the synthesized of peptides, and these could be placed against the database or the and all proteins are possible, and then the peptides that are produced from those proteins, and we can essentially identify the protein. And that's what we do in a regular, regular fashion all the time. The problem that I should really try to point out here is this step right here, this separation step. Uh, this Maldi part of this can actually take only a little bit of minutes. You can do a Maldi mass spectrum uh, in under five minutes easily. Whereas the separation step up here can usually take anywhere from several hours to several days, depending upon how complex the mixture is. If you're thinking about the way to try to characterize in a diagnostic sense, literally thousands of biological samples, and you're going to spend days on every one of those analyses, you're looking at uh, years to achieve a result. And that's something that uh, many people have been trying to figure out ways to improve the speed of this overall process. And so uh, that really became a target for us at one point. How can we do the separation step much more quickly? And also, while minimizing the amount of sample loss, so that we can then achieve an overall goal of improving the speed of the process. So, where we see that is what is that focusing right here? The focus that we are in fact depositing the sample on. And we ask the question could we, three, in fact, modify this focus so that we could actually achieve the separation directly on the focus of the Maldi target? And that led to uh, quite a few years worth of work. The basic ideas are something like this. And you would have your mixture of peptides, proteins, whatever the case may be. You would deposit them onto a surface that has a thin polymer film on it. That thin polymer film would have some sort of an affinity for some subset of those peptides or proteins. That subset of peptides and proteins would then be captured by the surface. We could get out a solvent that eludes the things that are not captured. We move that solvent off onto another target. We can do more work with that if we choose. But the bottom line is we've achieved now a separation via a single step process. And we can now then add our matrix to both of these samples, the one that will recapture the peptides and proteins, the peptides and proteins that we remove, and then add the matrix to the sample and go forward with the model process. And the idea would be that all of this could be possible to do within, say, uh, a couple of minutes, okay, as opposed to doing with many separation processes. So we turn this OPAC, one sort of thing to capture all the mass spectrometry. And in the original incarnation, we were doing this by using thin polymer films that were deposited using a radio frequency plasma. And I'm not going to spend any time really talking about that, but that technology for depositing thin films is going to be for the largest part of that. So I'm just going to show an example of a successful outcome here. Here we've taken this mixture that has basically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different peptides in it. And here's a conventional large mass spectrum of those nine peptides. And what I want to point out to you is that even though there's nine peptides here, you only see these subsets, four, five, six, seven, this is a good thing, four, five, six, seven, and there's a little tiny signal from number three. And if you look over here at four, five, six, and seven, the unique characteristic about them is that all of them are what we would refer to as basic peptides. And this is a classic problem in this to analysis by modern mass spectrometry. It's something called iron suppression. And what that means is that the basic peptides come to get ionized at the expense of the more acidic peptides. So now, in our technology, what we did is we modified that moldy target surface to incorporate acidic function, hydrochloric acid function, and then when we deposit the mixture on there using the approach that I described in the last slide, 
Well, we expect that all of the basic peptides, the six of the six cases, the electrophoric interaction, and that all of the acidic peptides should be removed. They should not want to have an acidic solution. And so we fractionate the sample into two subsets, and indeed, what you see here is that the, the sample that was captured on the surface contains the four different basic peptides with nine times of consistency. But more importantly now, we can go to the solution that's removed and look at the peptides that are there, and there is all the acidic peptides that we have missed in the original analysis. And so by using this technology, using this approach, we're able to very rapidly fractionate this sample and now get spectrum that shows us much more information than what we had in the conventional modern life cycle. And that's our goal. So when we did this whole thing, well, this fractionation took place one minute. Okay? So, uh, we spent a considerable amount of time uh, working with this over the years. We did lots of different surface modified fractionation steps. And I'm not going to spend the time, or I don't have the time to go through all the different uh, approaches that we use. But you can ever do everything from sort of class specific capture to very bio selective capture. Uh, we also work, I show you a picture of a multifunctional target. This is a target where we've actually took on all different types of chemistry. So now you can imagine structuring the sample with various types of chemistry, various specific capture motifs. And you can take them in some sort of mixture and very quickly visualize lots of different subsets of what's contained within that um, sample. But here's the problem. At this point, I need to take some important, uh, put some important points on the table. Uh, first off, an analog of this technology had already been developed uh, and was controlled in the patents of them by a company by the name of Scientism. In fact, we had early on lots of conflict with this company because they, even though we were an academic research group and weren't really particularly interested in trying to compete with them commercially, they, they seemed to feel that they didn't even want us to, to work in that area at all. And I said, well, I, I, I sort of ignored that and we went on anyhow. Um, over the years, there were other mass spectrometry companies that were also interested in trying to do this surface modification to achieve this fractionation. Uh, the most uh, notable one that I know was the Bruker that uh, took, the, took the approach of modifying everything but the surface of the sample was on, which is which things that you have to do when you're trying to get around the patent protection technology. Interesting thing, though, Cypress went out of business a few years ago. It was actually in the early 2000s, um, basically because their technology was never all that good. It was never as good as the things that we were doing. But because they controlled the patents, they couldn't really do anything about it. In the meantime, uh, we had moved on to the development of a new technology where we started actually, instead of using thin polymer films in the surface, we were actually using what we referred to as black polymer. And then I would just show a little bit of this work because this approach, this, this new movement, opened up the door for us to be able to uh, patent this technology. So the idea came about through a collaboration between myself and Dr. Dan Dyer. Uh, we came to this notion that one of the problems with these thin polymer films is that they are very two dimensional, and you can only capture such high presentations on the actual surface of the film. Whereas if we could use a brush polymer, it could have a much higher loading capacity, that is, it could be able to collect or definitively capture a much larger amount of material. And there would be advantages for this uh, in terms of being able to look at very small amounts of these targeted analogs within these mixtures. And so uh, we moved forward to create these brush polymer modified modern targets. And I don't I think I need to go into all the chemistry of how this is done, but these are the types of best polymers that are used. Um, you can see that you can incorporate long best polymer films that have specific functionalities in them, and ultimately these best polymers do in fact show uh, significant three-dimensional characteristics, that is, they have volume that can uptake the peptides and proteins. And they can, well, in this case, it is showing that the lateral expansion that is in this direction is minimal, but the vertical expansion is quite large. And we also demonstrated that just like with the thin polymer films, we can fractionate mixtures of peptides very easily. 
and all this could be accomplished in less than a few minutes. And here, I think the important outcome of all of this, because we took this approach of dealing with the dimensional modification of the modern target structure, we were able to patent this technology and patent this issue last month. And it's got my way of $8 million, $1,000,000, $1,000,000, $1,000,000, $1,000,000, $1,000,000, $1,000,000, $1,000,000, $1,000,000, $1,000,000, $1,000,000, $1,000,000, $1,000,000, $1,000,000, $1,000,000, $1
Well, that may not be the tool, or this may not be the tool for that application. The fact that the way that this is used or has been uh, suggested in my view is in terms of uh, finger printing or biomarker dissemination. In other words, you don't, the way you would do this is you would get all the test concentrations from, say, a healthy state test concentration or, or organism or a cell structure, and then you would do the same thing for the disease, and you would look for differential expression, right? Or you could say, I don't really care, and that might give you some clues as to which thing, hey, look, this person is massively upregulated in the disease state and, and as opposed to the healthy state. So we could target that. We could try to now find out what that is. But that process of targeting and finding out would be done in a separate step to bring that. And the other application that we see talked about a lot in this field is using these fingerprints as a basically diagnostic tool. In other words, I see some upregulation, some downregulation of the function of the disease state. Maybe there's nothing very, very obvious. It's not like uh, prostate treatment hormones in the PSA is massively upregulated in some disease state. But if there's little changes and they're reproducible, then I have a fingerprint that becomes essentially a diagnostic tool. I can now go to a patient, I can take that facial expression, I can do this analysis, and I say if your 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 fingerprint of this test of facial expression matches this disease state, I might be able to say, okay, uh, we need to do this with testing. Oh, right. Okay. Well, Marty, I, you know, I don't have time to talk about Marty. You see me work on two micro of samples, so you don't need large volumes of samples. Of course, you've got to have enough to be able to extract the proteins from the cell, but the proteins are typically very, very small. They've been using plastic methods like bead beading and other ways of opening the cell and extracting the protein. Um, finding the nice material really are a few. Yes. 